to hand it over to our first speaker, Michelle Bradford from Commodics. Thanks, Meg, and thanks to all of my colleagues on this panel. Um, my name is Michelle Bradford, and I'm the Commodics Chief of Party for the InJazz program that delivers um, educational services in Northeast Syria. Um, tonight, I'd like to share with you how we modified our psychosocial support program to respond to both the COVID-19 pandemic and an impact assessment for which data collection was completed just prior to the pandemic reaching Syria. I'm gonna focus more on the latter as we'd like to take this opportunity to initiate discussion with others working in this field and to learn from your experiences evaluating PSS or social and emotional learning programs in similar contexts. Um, so we've provided a structured psychosocial support program to more than 60,000 children across the Raqqa and Deir Ezzor governorates in largely informal and formal IDP camps, but also in formal schools that are supported by the local councils. Um, the rapid response nature of our program at the outset meant that we didn't have an opportunity to do a baseline at the start. Um, and we only conducted an impact assessment about a year after starting the implementation. Um, at that time, we consulted a senior researcher at Columbia University to help us select the three tools that you see at the top of your screen, the Rosenberg self-esteem, um, the SCARED 5, which is a shortened uh, tool, and then the Children's Hope Scale. Okay, um, while ideally we would have liked to use a randomized controlled trial, the unstable environment meant that we had to design the research to meet the project where it was. So in the formal camp, for example, the intervention group were children who had participated in the psychosocial support program for already a year by the time we started the assessment. And then the control group were children who had recently arrived from areas that were um, the latest in being liberated from ISIS control. Um, and those children had not yet started the psychosocial support program. Um, we had a number of research limitations, as I'm sure all of you can imagine. So I had previously mentioned we had a lack of baseline at the start of um, implementing our psychosocial support program. Um, that program was also designed to start with children as young as age six. But in fact, the three tools that we ended up selecting were recommended to be started with a slightly older population, um, so age 10 and older. Um, we recognize that there were a number of inherent response biases, as there are often in, in research generally, um, and then also cultural uh, factors. So, for example, more children reported having primary exposure to ISIS ideology than their caregivers did. So one possibility we considered is that caregivers were more hesitant to discuss their children attending um, facilities affiliated with ISIS because of general stigma in the community. Um, we also uh, recognize that while we tried to harmonize the content and the delivery of the program across the different local community-based organizations that we partnered with, we recognize that perhaps differences in capacity um, may have affected the, uh, the scores of children and, and kind of the services that they delivered and how they responded to those services. Um, and then lastly, in terms of those three tools that we selected, we recognize that they weren't created specifically for working with children in northeastern Syria. So it's possible that they weren't sensitive enough to capture the full picture of children's psychosocial well-being there. Um, See, next slide. So challenges, um, we lost 56% of our beneficiary population with the Turkish incursion in Northeast Syria in October of 2019. That military operation was then followed closely by um, an initiative by the Syrian Defense Forces to close a number of informal camps and move our beneficiaries into other camps where we didn't yet have access to them. Um, we also had a lot of pressure to launch research in the formal camp 
where that control group had arrived from areas that had been recently liberated from ISIS, um, and we didn't want to further delay their enrollment in the PSS program, so we had to launch very quickly. Um, and then lastly, as is the case that we face in most of our activities in Northeast, it's really difficult to get accurate numbers. And particularly when we were designing the sample sizes, it was really challenging to um, nail down exactly how many kids were in each camp. Um, so in terms of lessons learned, we have several of them we'd like to share with you. Um, so evaluating psychosocial well-being is challenging in and of itself. Um, which aspects of psychosocial well-being do you want to measure? And how do we take into consideration the impact of the PSS programming on our beneficiaries' willingness to talk about their experiences? Um, I've already discussed kind of the need to be flexible in terms of the very like changing and fluid environment that we continue to operate in. Um, I think our results also show a really strong correlation generally between caregivers and children's perceptions. So I think for those programs that may be facing um, budget restrictions, as we usually are, a program could decide to interview kind of one um, or the other instead of both as we did. Um, I think also using the previously developed tools, for example, the three that we used, can be useful if you want to compare results across projects or countries within a region, but it definitely takes more time in terms of data collection and analysis. And as we learned, there are additional costs involved, particularly for those tools where you have to pay to be able to access the tool. Um, the other option is to develop bespoke tools that assess areas that are of direct importance for your program. And lastly, if your program is like ours with limited funding and very short implementation timelines, we recommend developing data collection so that each round can give you some insights into the impact without relying solely on an endline assessment that may or may not happen. Um, so now I'll just touch briefly on the research findings specifically in the camps. Um, so here at the top of the slide, um, you can see generally that we found that children who participated in the psychosocial support programming scored um, higher than those who did not have access to the program at the time of our data collection. We also noticed that the informal camp group had um, statistically significant lower scores than those in the formal camp. Um, and specifically for self-esteem and children's hope. So we hypothesize that one reason for this could be the different living situations of the children. Children in informal camps face greater insecurity, less stability, and have access to far fewer services. So in terms of the data, um, we identified six areas of high concern with the majority of those areas in uh, the field of children's hope. And here's just some additional areas of high concern. Um, we saw a number of difficulties in problem solving. And as you can see in the last three bullets on this slide, again, a general lack of hope in their future. So our recommendations are really straightforward for those of you who may be um, thinking of entering the space in terms of providing psychosocial support programming or social and emotional learning um, in this specific population in the Northeast. Um, so really the focus areas that we found were um, trying to build up children's hope for the future, trying to help them process the anxiety that they're experiencing, and also to build up their self-esteem. Um, so we also conducted informal research into how these areas of high concern were then exacerbated by the pandemic and the related lockdowns that started in about March or April this year, and then the further reduction of services for IDPs living in both the formal and informal camps. Um, so you'll see here some of our findings on that, but it tracks similarly to what we found in the formal uh, PSS impact assessment that we conducted. So 
We had to modify the curriculum to address both the findings of our assessment, but then we also had to quickly modify the delivery method because of the pandemic. Um, so what we did in a formal camp, for example, in Derazor, is we built an intranet system. So it was a closed system that then allowed people in the camp to access that. We found um, available software in Arabic to have an interface that then created virtual classrooms. Um, then we were lucky enough to have a number of teachers um, and PSS facilitators that were resident in the camp. And so they were able to um, share the content of our PSS program that's also integrated with the remedial education program. So both sets of that uh, content was then shared over Bluetooth by teachers um, for children who couldn't yet access the internet. You'll see on the screen, there's a map. We had kind of five towers set up in the camp, but um, it took us a while to get those set up. So when the first tower went up, children in the rest of the camp didn't yet have access to the internet. Um, we then had to modify the content of our program. So we included a lot more learning activities for children that they could do with their siblings and their caregivers at home. Um, we incorporated the COVID-19 messaging. Um, and then we also uh, deployed child protection officers to conduct uh, an increased number of home visits, given that um, the lockdown conditions kind of exacerbated issues that were already happening uh, with children and their families. So um, I'll now just quickly show a short video um, that has a few reflections from children and their caregivers. Since the start of INJAZ, the project delivered structured PSS to 72,700 children in formal school. Michelle, it's black and not showing. Are you aware? No, I'm not. Okay. Um, yeah, we've been chatting with you. Maybe. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, Anita can see it. So maybe if enough people can see it, then that's great. I can't. but it seems our participants cannot see it, judging by the, uh, the chat. Um, well, sorry to all of those of you who could not see the video. We clearly haven't quite figured out the technology, um, but generally it was just a video capturing some of the comments of our children and caregivers specifically talking about how the content um, had improved kind of their daily reactions. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to share a little bit about our program with you. And I want to hand over to um, my fellow panelist, Anita. She's with the Global Trauma Project and she'll be up next. Thank you and good morning. Can I get a thumbs up? I can only see my participants, but can you hear me? I'm sorry, the other speakers. Is the voice okay? You can hear me? Excellent. So my mantra this year 
A ship is safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are for. So on behalf of Global Trauma Project, I'm so excited to talk about smooth sailing, stormy seas, and safe harbor, and tell you more about how our foundational framework, the Trauma-Informed Community Empowerment Framework, has allowed us to be anchored and yet adaptable in times of COVID. I'll begin the presentation, and then my colleague Juma will finish it off. But 2020, what? a year. Despite our best intentions and our resources and our vision, I personally feel very battered. But that's why I keep on coming back to that mantra. We are made for this. This literally is our, we are living our work. I'm now in uh, California in the United States, and I was talking to my colleagues in Kenya, where the organization is based, um, in February and telling them um, how TICE or framework applies to COVID. And they didn't quite get it yet because our um, shutdowns were about two or three weeks ahead of theirs. And I said, oh my goodness, this is it. Everything that we're talking about, I am personally living it. <laughs> and slowly they saw it um, as well. So I'm delighted to talk to you more today about our programs and our results. And the core of our program is really self-reflection and self-care. Um, because we are a capacity building program, so we work with local providers to increase the resilience, even amidst stress, crisis, and adversity. Because unfortunately, there are constant sources of stress. So this is just an example of one way we contextualize the best mental health resources to different communities. So the top line is a woman um, carrying a load of sticks, and she, like all of us, has only so much that she can carry. And on the bottom line is a man carrying bricks. Um, and it's a completely subjective measurement, like a lot of psychosocial um, and mental health issues are. What do I feel I can handle? What is my normal? And if I'm getting to the breaking point, what do I do about it? And you may have seen that, oops, sorry, um, this recent graphic that has made the rounds, I think about three or four weeks ago, I was like, oh my goodness, this is brilliant. This is about, um, stress amongst first responders. But then when I looked at it and compared, I said, yes, exactly. This is what we do. We take the same concepts. What do people need to know to thrive? And how can we base it on their experiences and their wisdom so they can re uh, integrate the information into their daily lives? Because we really think that mental health is a social justice issue and that all communities deserve support that is comprehensive contextualized and effective. And the areas that we work um, are tough. They're tough environments, and yet the people remain resilient and amazing. So this is data from 243 participants in South Sudan. So at the beginning of our program, 36% of them had, sorry, had symptoms that were consistent with a PTSD diagnosis, post-traumatic stress disorder. And 100% of them had um, difficulty in controlling their emotions. And whereas some people and organizations see that as overwhelm of like it's too much, we see it as opportunity because we believe um, in people's inherent resilience. And so that's what we do. At Global Trauma Project, we prevent and reduce the impacts of trauma so that individuals, families, and communities can thrive. And we particularly do that in areas that are affected by different types of trauma especially historical or intergenerational and collective trauma, and where there aren't already mental health, effective mental health supports. And our whole model, because it's capacity building, is really working with the local leaders to make sure that efforts are um, integrated and sustainable. Um, so this, once again, is in our South Sudanese program. We're so fortunate to work with the New School for Social Research to um, evaluate our impacts, just showing um, the power of, of proper support, that there was one third reduction in PTSD diagnosis. There was a um, significant changes in heart rate variability, which is an indicator of um, the nervous system, nervous system health and critical heart stress. And the changes improved over time, which they found astounding. And our hypothesis is it's because our concepts are able to be easily integrated. So even if we're not there, which we shouldn't be there, we don't wanna be there, 
Um, our participants take it in and practice it on their daily lives. We have people um, say a year later, they carry their flip, we're completely off tech, well, we were completely off tech, we'll, we'll talk more about that later. <laughs> people carry their flip charts with them wherever they go over one year later. Um, so this is our technical framework, once again, the trauma-informed community empowerment framework. And it's a flexible framework that deals with the six core components that are often impacted by trauma. For each of the components, we have key targets. And we don't tell providers exactly what to do because they are the local experts in their communities. Instead, we talk about these core concepts, look what they're already doing well, and look where um, there are possible gaps and how they can improve those. But as I said, we are all about contextualization. So instead of slides like this, we create um, graphics like this. So the, the more colorful one is the TICE wheel for Somalia, and the more neutral one is our current project um, in Kenya. And with that, I'm so excited to introduce my colleague, Juma, who will tell you more about our project. Um, thank you very much, Anita. Um, just give me a minute. Thank you, thank you, Anita, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's uh, 26 minutes past 10 in Kenya, so good evening. At the beginning of this year at uh, GTP, we were ready to set sail. Um, with our main project, which was to create uh, safe spaces for young girls and women uh, in our local villages, where they will be mentored by our ties wellness uh, facilitators. And the aim of these uh, wellness spaces, or rather safe spaces, was to reduce intimate partner violence. In partnership with the Population Council, we were able to conduct a girl roster, which uh, targeted 1,613 girls and the results of the survey that we conducted shows that 43% uh, of the girls who are aged between the ages of six and 17 were extremely off track. Uh, off track in this case means that they are either out of school, living with, with neither parent or uh, in a child marriage, or they have a kid. And uh, this was conducted in two wards and 50% of the girls that we were able to reach uh, showed that they were actually two years below grade in schooling. And this happened uh, two weeks before COVID hit Kenya. And uh, as uh, William Arthur says, the pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expects to change, it to change, and the re realist adjust the sales. So at, uh, at GTP, we, we believe that uh, the TICE framework that we've created, it is not uh, mandated to say what to do, but rather focuses on uh, the how, the why and the how. And as you all know, we trust our community leaders to be very intentional in creating uh, trauma-informed initiatives. Therefore, we had to adjust our strategy after COVID happened, because when COVID happened, it came with a lot of uh, restrictions which among them were like uh, wearing masks and so much. It was very bad in some parts of Kenya. So in partnership with the Mentor360 and other partners, community-based organizations like the Champions for Change, we undertook a mask campaign, a mask distribution campaign. These masks were um, had, uh, printed uh, messages on them, messages of hope. And as you can see on your screen, uh, those are part of our community partners or distributing the masks in the community and also some uh, stickers. While our community partners were doing this uh, mask distribution, because we work with community partners, they also conducted a survey just to see how people are doing in the communities. And the survey results showed that uh, we, we were able to reach over 600 uh, households. And the survey we conducted shows that showed that uh, 78% of those we surveyed had noticed an increase in conflict. 91% knew someone who was stressed or needed uh, more support. And 56% of those that we surveyed did not know any mental health providers within their community, which is actually quite uh, shocking. 
Um, at GTP, we've uh, remained focused on creating safe spaces. And these space spaces are meant to um, help members of the community access mental trauma and mental health care. Currently, what we are doing is uh, we, we've created, we've, we've stayed uh, committed to our plan to create more space, more safe spaces. Currently, we've been able to create our one in Diani where we are based. And as you can see in the photos, those are part of our team members and also our office when it was being created, which also serves as a wellness uh, space. We've also partnered with other uh, partners to create a program for a, uh, in a project that aims at uh, countering violent extremism. And uh, currently, we are training community leaders on the ICE framework, which is going to help them over, you know, support their communities in uh, overcoming uh, trauma-related challenges. Um, I'm going to pass back to Anita so that he can be able to just finalize on our presentation and thank a lot for your time. Thank you. And recognizing that we need to reach children and youth where they are, which is usually at home and often watching TV because they're not in school, we've partnered with an organization called Project Hand Up, which used to go to the remotest villages and do health education puppet shows about gender and HIV and AIDS, but they too had, it. We, we call it our pandemic pivot. What do we have to do in response to the current situation to keep to our values and keep to our missions? So we have a series of videos. They have a series of COVID specific videos called Ask Dr. Pomoja, which is translated in five different local languages and is also on um, UNICEF's Internet of Good Thing, which is a free website within Kenya that people can access so working with them for mental health resources on that same platform. So in conclusion, we wish you smooth sailing, but we always need to be prepared for the worst. Um, we welcome you to reach out and connect. Our website is unfortunately out of date, but we're happy, we need to update it. We're happy to talk with you more. And we also have um, Angaza masks um, um, if you're interested in um, supporting that as well. But now I pass it along to Lucy, who will show us a great video of, um, from CRS. Everyone who wants peace and reconciliation in your country, turn on your cameras and please wave. Everybody who wants peace. Okay. Sometimes Lucy, you're, you're on mute still. There you go. You can hear me? Mm -hmm. you, can he you can hear me now? Yes. Oh, terrific. Okay. So greetings to everybody. Thank you for your patience. Um, I'm the Lucy Steinitz. I'm the Senior Technical Advisor for Protection at CRS at Catholic Relief Services. I'm going to talk to you um, today about a particular intervention called Rising from Resilient Roots. Um, this is part of CRS's 3B peacebuilding project. I'm going to step back for a moment and show you we have the binding which is the internal work we do within ourselves, then the bonding with our families and community and um, immediate identity group, our own communities, and then the bridging to the other. Rising from Resilient Roots focuses mostly on the individual and a little bit to our families and immediate communities. Um, if you want to know about all of our tools, you can visit our site during the break time. And I think Nell Bolton at four o'clock today is also giving an overview um, or check our website. Um, now, the history of Rising from Resilient Roots is that it came, this is Rising from Resilient Roots, um, but it came from another um, intervention that we developed for children which is a much longer one called Singing to the Lions, which is designed to help children address fear and violence in their lives. But the adults, the parents of the, these children, older youth um, community members said, we want something too. We want also to have an intervention, but we only have one day. Now, all of us are familiar with how projects try to squeeze everything in one day. What could we do for one day that had integrity to it? 
So that's how Rising from Resilient Roots um, was developed, adapted. It does not directly address trauma, although it is trauma sensitive. We describe it as a, um, a workshop, a one day workshop. It can be divided into several sessions that is designed to help participants, both youth and adults, in conflict affected and marginalized environments to find more balance in their lives by emphasizing positive attributes that they have, capacities that may be a little hidden, but are within them, and teaching skills that help reduce stress and anxiety. It had been in person, like everything that we've all been doing, but we needed to go virtual. And so we designed a training of facilitators or a training of trainers, but the implementation in local communities is still in person. And we then would ask for videos back, little phone videos of how folks are doing to monitor that. And we had also people going out in the community for coaching, um, feedback and support. Um, for example, in the Sahel, from the video that you'll be seeing, this is one in English. We have it in English and French, um, the training of facilitators. Um, that was done in Northern Ghana in the Sahel. Um, 20, immediately, it was 20 other workshops that were then fanned out into the community. And we took some raw footage. I have to emphasize this is very raw footage from the training of facilitators online. And here we go. One who wants peace and reconciliation in your country, turn on your cameras and please wave. Everybody who wants peace. Okay. Sometimes thinking about bad things or feeling fear is helpful because that can protect us and from thinking danger. about bad things. Um, or can everyone fear give an example of this? Help and please rec everyone, everyone who wants peace and, rec and reconciliation in your country, in your country turn, turn on Sorry, you're getting this again. Please wave. wave. Everybody, Everybody who wants, who wants peace. Okay. Okay. Sometimes thinking about bad things or feeling fear is helpful because that can protect us from danger. Um, can everyone give an example of this and please write? Mm, if the dog is chasing me, it's good for me to feel fear, right? Because then you'll run. That's a very good point. When you're driving and you recall an accident scene, you reduce your speed. That's very good. Okay. What is your favorite channel so far? I see some people say happy channel, sports channel, Everyone's saying different things. I see dance channel in there too. What do we do? And you can draw directly on your slide what you can do. Okay, so somebody goes away to nature. Somebody puts feelings in a box and then things are on the rise. I have a question. Sure, what is your question? Yes, um, looking at uh, the changing channels, um, the human being is a social being and um, the TV is more mechanical. And as a social being, the impulse that affects your feelings, your emotions, your thinking live or are within the same environment with you. The feeling might come from people within your own family, society, or whatever. So you change the channel, by the next minutes, the channel comes back and you see it live again. <laughs> you change it and it comes back. You change it, it comes back because the impulse are from within the same environment that you live until you, and it is not likely you change the environment. What happened? And I think it's really important. I think, uh, Nuhu, you bring up a really good point, like Lucy was saying. It's all about like just that step-by-step -step process. And sometimes I think humans, we find ourselves in very difficult situations, especially in conflict zones, like you mentioned, where maybe the house has been burned down or some maybe the husband has died. 
we find ourselves in such difficult situations. But I think one of the key here is that um, little by little, we can start to change the way we think and change the way we feel to kind of try to improve our environment, but to also change. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's not so easy where it just happens immediately. But like Lucy said, stick by stick or little by little, you can start to make that change. Time. This is the review of the core message. We can change the channel. We change can the channel. change the channel. Okay, Vincent, I'm not seeing you're changing the channel. Okay, not moving on until you change. No, not thumbs up. Change the channel. Okay, take both arms. Change the channel. Okay. Change the channel. Yes. Change the channel. Very, very good. Bob, change the channel. I see your face, but not your changing the channel. Very, very good. So willpower really gives us the, um, the ability for behavior change. We can do this. Everybody has this in themselves. Okay, that's the core message here. Okay, so normally what we would be doing um, at this point, normally I mean in a regular training, face to face, is we would take all of the trees that all of you drew and hang them up on the wall. You're going to see that virtually in a minute. And then you as a facilitator will ask the following question here. The tree will fall over from the wind. It might lose, it can be uprooted, yes. That's in the chat box. It might lose their leaves. The tree could be destroyed. Yes, correct. What do we have here? All these trees together. Some of these are, oh, they're beautiful trees. Yes, thank you so much. I'm leaning forward so I can read it carefully. Okay, we're not going to read everybody's trees, but we will see that you've done a really good job. So what's this? Okay, you're right. This is a forest. <laughs> this is many trees put together, but basically the trees protect each other. Isn't that true? In a forest, trees are, the individual tree is no longer vulnerable. The trees protect each other. They were all different kinds of trees. And that's true of us as people too. We all look different. We all um, are different, but when we stand together like a, the trees of a forest, we can protect each other. Isn't that true? Yes, yes. Um, I would encourage the youth, especially young girls, to believe in themselves and to mm -hmm. know that they can make and they should be confident and they shouldn't be afraid of not being able to exhibit their skills and talents. That's once you're confident in what you believe in, you are able to attain it. What will you do differently in your life because of this workshop? Please type your commitment into the slide and then be prepared to share it. So this is John. Mm, what I'll do differently as a result of this uh, long this activity or training is that over here in our world usually it's very difficult to partner with somebody trusting people uh, is very difficult but I've seen that uh, if you are able to partner with somebody just like uh, myself being a single tree I'll be able to be blown out because of the storm but uh, if I come together with somebody and we assume the coat of, uh, let's say, a forest, we'll be able to achieve more. So from today, I'll be able to uh, use the three Bs in order to achieve more in life. And also, with relation to the project, we'll be able to impact the life of these people. Over. Thank you. And so we're at the end of this training. And um, first off, I'd like to say thank you for your time. Thank you for participating. This has been a really great experience for us. 
we usually deliver this training in person. Uh, Lucy would come to Ghana and deliver this. But with COVID-19, we really had to deliver it virtually to make sure that you have the resources that are necessary. And so part of our monitoring and evaluation, we want to make sure that you learned how to do these activities. And so the first step, we, we are asking you to record yourself delivering at least one of the activities in the manual to family members. And then we'll ask you to send that recording to myself or Lucy. We're asking that you do this within seven calendar days of this training. So today is Monday. You have until next Monday to deliver that to us. It was a good experience. I think it's, it's been a long time since I have had the opportunity to share like this. Mm -hmm. I mostly, <laughs> I mostly work in areas where I encourage people to share, but I hardly find time myself to share. So. you're on. Thank you, Lucy. Hi, my name is Laurel Bradley. I am the Technical Manager for Gender and Inclusion at Management Systems International. Um, and for today, I want to talk a little bit about um, an overview of a six-month MHPSS project that uh, we're now launching under the Genocide Recovery and Persecution Response Learning and Pilots Program in Northern Iraq. Um, while this pilot activity was conceived before COVID, um, it, the, the design of it was done when we realized that COVID was going to be a fairly serious and sort of lengthy um, pandemic that we would all be needing to deal with. So we did think about the detailed design specifically instead of a pivot, but specifically within the COVID context. Um, due to this, we were not only thinking about, okay, how do we do this in remote implementation, but how do we carry forward some of our um, critical considerations into how we want to implement this project, but also what kind of outcomes, how do we maintain the outcomes that we were initially planning um, in order to make this pilot the success and to deliver what we hope to deliver. So as a quick overview, the Genocide Recovery and Persecution Response Project um, contributes to the recovery of women and girls in the Nineveh Plains in ethnic and religious minority communities, including those who survived GBV during the ISIS invasion. And the pushpin here indicates the area where the um, pilot will be implemented. Um, so again, in, in Northern Iraq. Um, and there are five learning projects under this activity um, that deal with livelihoods, um, legal issues, gender sensitive negotiation. We have a pilot that focuses on the empowerment of adolescent girls. And then this pilot, which looks at uh, mental health and psychosocial support services. All the pilots have some degree of MHPSS in them, but this pilot specifically focuses on building psychosocial well being um, through a curriculum that's focused on developing self guided stress management skills and developing community based peer support networks. Um, so, we're looking really at how can we integrate uh, these PSS tools into communities um, to build resilience and to build well being. Um, this pilot is targeted at a community where many of the women have experienced displacement um, and more, and so they have returned to their home communities, but we're also looking at the host community, women in the host communities as well. So we're dealing with a really wide range of experiences when we think about what is um, psychosocial well being. So some of the anticipated outcomes, um, again, as I said, we're trying to keep some of these outcomes in place. These were originally sort of conceptualized and then we're bringing them into our design. Um, and they factored into thinking about how we wanted to switch to remote implementation. Um, so in the six month pilot, what we're looking to do is improve the PSS well-being among women and girls, among returnees and host communities that experience conflict and gender-based violence. We're looking to provide women with skills in graphic design and self-guided stress management in um, these activities. We're trying to create supportive spaces for women to develop relationships, to build self-confidence, and to increase their self-efficacy as well as using their creativity and to find ways to overcome isolation. And we're looking to increase the acceptance in, these commun in this community um, and among prospective families for MHPSS services and, to, and for MHPSS activities, such as the graphic design training um, and for peer-based stress management support. So at the beginning of this activity, we did a desk review. 
And what we looked at was literature that was coming out right at the end of the ISIS invasion. So it was at a very specific contextual moment where the situation was changing from humanitarian to development. Um, and one of the things that we really did was try to capture those learnings that we've gone back to again and again as we did community engagement and as we looked at um, designing and implementing these pilots. Um, and these are still uh, issues that we looked very closely at as we tried to, as we're working to do remote implementation. So one of the things that we found was in that specific literature at that time, there was insufficient mental health professionals in Northern Iraq, and that led to a heavy reliance on NGO staff. Um, we also found that there were quality gaps in the MP N MHPSS services offered by some NGOs during those early interventions right after the ISIS invasion, um, and that led to some inconsistencies in the delivery of needed services. We found that there was intense media interest in women and girls survivors of ISIS and some unethical practices by the media and NGOs around that interest, um, which caused re-traumatization, exploitative use of women and girls' images and accounts, and insufficient informed consent. And we found that some of these immediate response approaches were necessary, and they were trying to do this, this sort of um, initial sort of pro provision of services within affected communities, but what they weren't able to do with that need for an initial response was really build and strengthen the community-based services and resources that eventually would be needed over time to continue building um, mental health and psychosocial well-being. So the, this slide provides an illustration of some of the key questions that we've been asking throughout the, throughout the pilots that have sort of heightened interest now that we're sort of designing specifically for COVID. And that is how to identify partner organizations that would be accepted by minority communities with the capacity to deliver programming. So now we have to ask, and can they do it online? <laughs> so we're adding that sort of thought process as well. Um, we're looking at how to best ensure program activities account for the safety, privacy, and the wishes of beneficiaries. Um, again, thinking about privacy, online environments um, add a number of different considerations that we need to take into account. We're looking at how to design and test innovative pilots that respond to gender-based violence. And we're looking at how to design activities that are responsive to local interests and the needs of the communities. Um, so there was a focus on incorporating the, so for our project, we designed ethical guidance and protocols that specifically fit the communities we were working in and then their needs for privacy and protection. So we are looking at bringing those guidelines and protocols and the learning that we had from this desk review and that we've gained over the course of the pilots along with the expertise of our staff and our local partners to really understand how to think about designing a project specifically for the context that we're now in. So in regards to mapping, mapping um, existing local resources uh, to support psychosocial well-being, such as through referrals, and also to understand local perceptions of distress and coping so that we're targeting activities correctly. Um, one of the things that we're doing is using agile methods for mapping and assessment. So like phone, online, making sure that we're not endangering people as, to the extent that we can by br cutting down on the in-person interactions. Um, one of the things that we learned from our earlier pilots was that a lot of the community leaders are elders and they're not as comfortable with online uh, solutions. So thinking a lot about using the phone, using layered approaches and finding ways in which to um, engage with them appropriately. Um, another thing that we're doing is supporting community leaders to develop, develop their skills as uh, PSS support helpers, including making sure they get psychosocial first aid training. Again, we're shifting to remote implementation to, to provide this training along with other services. And we're also making sure that they have linkages to um, MHPSS and GBV services so that they're able to help make those connections for people in their communities who might need those services. But another key issue is making sure that the post-training support is available from the local partner for these um, points of contact within the community going forward. Um, another issue that we're looking at is strengthening the positive social connections the, and providing self-guided stress management skills and PSS care among women GBV survivors. Um, this is done through facilitated, um, well, one of the ways we're doing this, there are a couple of ways, but a key way that we're doing this is through additional social networking activities, trying to connect women, trying to make these connections to referrals and services, and trying to build these social networks that can really help um, address some of the key issues that women and girls are facing in these communities. Um, 
one of the interesting things about this pilot is we're taking um, graphic design training that we actually used in a livelihoods project and we're bringing it over to look at it in the PSS space. And so we actually went through a process of working with the local partner to really integrate graphic design as a PSS tool into some of the other sessions that um, we're doing, including stress management. So we're really, in doing this, we're working with the local partner to really think about that integration, but also how do they hire staff that are able to, to do this kind of training online? So we're thinking a lot about staff recruitment. We're thinking a lot about how to integrate different kinds of activities and how to really hit on those moments where we can sort of um, deepen the resources and the skills available to the women in these communities to enhance their um, psychosocial health and also to, to share that within their families, their households, and their, with other community members. Um, we're providing women who were previously displaced and the host uh, population access to information on MHPSS and GBV services and referrals. And one of the key ways we're doing this is through the facilitated stress management sessions, but we're also doing this through um, different kinds of community engage engagement and awareness raising. Um, GBV is extremely sensitive in these communities. It's not something that you talk about lightly. So we really do need to make sure that the messages are crafted, that they are careful, and that they fit within social sort of perceptions and norms and practices so that they don't sort of raise additional issues while we're trying to sort of make these connections to services. Um, and then we are, again, just emphasizing our ethical guidelines and um, practices in order to make sure that there is informed consent, that privacy is respected, um, and that we're really mitigating the risk as much as we can. And part of this is really looking at how we're doing the training for the remote peer facilitators and the supervisors and making sure that that training is in place and ongoing and supported um, going forward. And then we're developing a recruitment plan as well for the participants so to really look at how are they able to safely participate in these programs. Um, and part of this has to do with some mindset perception evaluations we're using in other assessments to really think through the fact that as many of us know, homes are not necessarily safe places. So thinking about as we're bringing MHPSS programs and implementing them in part in homes, what additional things do we need to think about women's support for their participation and sort of what unintentional consequences might be raised when they are sort of engaging in these sessions and gaining this information, but in a home environment where there may not be full support, especially when we know that household stressors are going up dramatically with the um, ripple effects coming out of COVID, such as greater unemployment, economic stress, and these other factors. Um, so as part of our recruitment, we're really trying to think about how to get, at, get in front of some of those um, unintentional risks that might be raised for women for the, from their participation in these programs. Um, again, we're doing a lot of community engagement and thinking with a variety and diversity of community leaders and influencers. And one of the key things that we're really thinking about is how do we configure those groups? How do we really make sure that community engagement is effective? Um, and then we know that women uh, before COVID were very isolated in these communities. We know that COVID's making it worse for many women. We also know that there is um, a great deal of reconfiguration of women's time commitments, of the labor burdens within households. And so really thinking about what is the scheduling of these sessions? How are we offering this, these sessions? What are we asking of women's time in order to really encourage them to participate as the, one of the key goals of the pilot is to address women's social isolation. So really thinking about how we can lower some of those barriers in terms of how we establish their opportunities for their participation. Um, and finally, I just wanted to review quickly what we were hoping to learn. These are learning pilots. That's one of the things that we're pulling out of um, this program is a lot of learning from our implementation of these sort of uh, different, differently configured strategies to address GBV. Um, so as I said bef before, that we really did design this uh, pilot to be delivered remotely um, and with careful planning and community engagement to support that. Um, and we're interested to see how these considerations unroll during the project in the context of COVID, but also um, with normal, you know, the normal adjustment you do during implementation. So how, how do these uh, different design features that we've put in place, how do they play out? Um, we're interested to see how combining multiple kinds of complementary activities in this context support women's skills building and their improved psychosocial health. 
Um, we're interested to see how women participants articulate their ability to use this training and opportunities to build social connections to address their own needs. Um, and we're interested in how women participants can take targeted training designed for this pilot and translate it into new activities that build their well-being in households and communities. And I would add to that how they're thinking about technology in that process and what those tools can mean for them in terms of continuing to enact some of the skills and some of the resources that are you know, inherent within this pilot that we're hoping to sort of expose them to. Um, and when finally, we're interested in how we can target strategic capacity building for investments to make the most use of the resources that are on the ground, um, at the same time address the widespread context of gender-based violence in Northern Iraq. So this is definitely a work in progress um, and we really are hoping to sort of see these positive results as we go forward um, and we'll see where it goes. But thank you very much. And Meg, I think it is back to you. Hey. Thank you so much, Laurel. Thank you so much to everyone. That was so amazing and interesting. And I think it's really cool to see the arc of all these different programs. You know, Laurel, you're in the very beginning kind of design and implementation phase and it's like smack dab right in the middle of COVID. And so you have to bring that in from the very beginning, you know, to other programs like GTP, you know, this is a, a model that you've used so many different times and, you know, molding it along the way. So I, it's just been so interesting to hear from you and you guys are amazing people doing an amazing work. Um, I would like, we have about 30 minutes, which is great. Um, so I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, please feel free to add your questions to chat. I think there's a way that we can like have you speak directly to our lovely panel. I'm not exactly sure how that is, but let's start with questions on uh, on chat for free. So feel free. Um, while you're adding your question, well, I have two to start. So let me just take my privilege as moderator. One quickly, Laurel, so you were talking about how to, you know, people are isolated inside you know kind of stuck indoors aren't able to access safe spaces in the public so obviously though you know um those constraints wouldn't necessarily lend to like a free um form conversation on the phone or like over zoom to discuss issues so what have you found conclusions to that have you found a way to have engagement that is safe like would you just would does that lend itself to like SMS texts or like what platforms would you use? Yeah, sorry, I had a moment with the unmute. Um, yes, so uh, in prior projects, that's one of the things that we did sort of, that we've sort of been looking at. Um, and one thing, we did protocols actually, our, one of our local partners developed protocols for how to do um, remote engagement on sensitive topics. And one of the things is make sure you establish a safe word for when the conversation needs to stop. Mm. Um, may, you know, ask questions like, is, you know, really reiterate throughout the conversation, is this still a good time to talk? Um, and make sure that it's still working. Um, for women who feel um, secure in their own cell phone uh, data, um, we have uh, chat groups amongst, um, in a different pilot, we had chat groups set up amongst the women and they were really talking about some of these issues and sharing. So um, one of the big things that we try to do or that we have done in our other pilots is really ask what the women themselves are comfortable with. Um, again, with the adolescent girls, when uh, we do that pilot, what are they comfortable with? What's safe for them? But also keep in mind that we have a broader picture and we're also bringing some of those safeguards in as well. So trying to find a happy medium that makes uh, the participants feel really like they can uh, participate and sort of build these connections as they want to, but also our responsibility is to really sort of think about those potential unintended consequences and sort of mitigate against them. Mm -hmm. um, well, again, people, please participants, Please feel free to add your questions to the chat. Um, one question I have for everyone is about layered trauma and layered anxiety. And I recently conducted um, an assessment in Burkina Faso, Niger, and was intended to focus on these one this one focus of kind of operational restrictions because of violent extremism and 
in the end, people were just speaking about COVID restrictions and how that's impacted them. And so I'm curious from your observations or conversations with your, your colleagues in the field, your beneficiaries in the field, has COVID risen to the top of people's concerns and um, mental health issues or triggers? Or are people, are, are people talking about more of those root issues um, being violence from an incursion or a VE group, et cetera? Juma, do you have any thoughts on that from our um, team leader training, which was, I believe, three weeks ago? So, sorry, Anita, come down, come, 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 come. Up. Did, we, we held a team leader training about three weeks ago. So did you have any response yes. to that about, because it is a trauma training, but of course COVID is the reality. Um, so what were people's yes. concerns? Was it mainly COVID day-to-day -day related or was it the underlying um, issues as well? Yes, um, uh, actually, Meg, I think that's a very good question. Back here in Kenya, I think it depends on who you're asking. If you ask the youth, the young people, the, their greatest concern is uh, employment. Most of them have, have, haven't been employed for a long period of time. Most of the parents, most of the young parents have lost their jobs. If you ask the same question to the business owners, guys who are on, like where we are located in Diani, which is the south coast of Kenya, a lot of businesses have had to close down. So the business owners, uh, COVID has been quite quite a big issue to them. Um, to the youth, unemployment still remains to be top of the top uh, of their concerns in terms to stress and what's not. Because uh, if you look down here, yes, COVID has had uh, a very, a very, um, the impact has been very hard on almost everyone. But uh, their biggest challenge is that they do not have money to put food on their tables and to feed their families. And as you might know in our communities down here, especially for us young men, we are mandated to feed our families. It is expected of us. So if I'm in a position where I can't do it, it's quite traumatizing for, for me and also especially for, them, uh, for a lot of youth out there. So for the youth is unemployment for the business owners and those who have been employed uh it's covid which is very unfortunate back to you meg thanks juma we're gonna get some dog barking in the in the back um thank you for that response um nicole i saw that you had your hand raised um so I, I think you've been, you're able to speak now. I think if you can just unmute yourself and then you can share your question. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Oh, oh, great. Okay. <laughs> um, thanks. So uh, Nicole Paterno from the uh, U USAID Center for Conflict and Violence Prevention. Um, thank you so much for the presentations and for, for everyone's time. Uh, yesterday, I attended um, another sort of trauma-informed uh, programming discussion from Beyond Conflict, um, and they were highlighting the fact that um, clinical psychologists, uh, you know, PhDs on cognitive and behavioral issues, um, and development practitioners don't always speak the same language, um, and sometimes they don't even play very nice with each other in the sandbox. Um, so my question to you is, do you as practitioners um, feel like you have the right tools for applied learning and assessing, um, you know, impact, providing evidence-based, um, you know, reporting on impact, and that you just need essentially more money from donors to be able to roll out, as Michelle said, you know, uh, uh, baselines and endlines, or um, if you could talk about, if not, what you think that you need from specialists at this point to do your work as practitioners in the field uh, better. Thanks. I have one response to that, um, if that's all right. Um, thanks very much, um, Nicole. I was with you at that session yesterday. It was excellent. 
Um, I think that um, one area where professionals are very much needed is in dealing with the almost inevitable burnout on the part of the staff in the countries who have to take the tools, however good they are. I'd like to think we have good tools. Other people have good tools, but they do it over and over and over again. And they themselves have also experienced a lot of the same trauma. Um, and so um, opportunities for self-care, for feedback, for coaching, most of these, almost all of them are not professionals, even if we have them working in pairs to support each other which is part of our mandate, they need the additional support and having kind of round robin group supervision, however that's designed, um, and also other self-care mechanisms and building that into the projects um, would be a huge help. Um, if I can Nicole, add to, oops, sorry. sorry. If, if I can add to what uh, Lucy is saying, actually, um, a few weeks back we were a few weeks back we were interacting with uh, some community leaders who were involved in trauma work and one of them was actually telling us that he has witnessed over 37 post-mortem uh, activities and so many more uh, we have parents i mean the fathers of these uh, the household heads of these families have been killed uh, in the presence of their families and these community leaders not been able to get actually any trauma support. And that is where at GTP, we are very committed to ensuring that uh, community leaders, community caregivers are uh, well equipped, uh, well taken care of to also not only to build their capacity, but to also help them uh, heal the, the traumas and stresses that they have to face on every day in uh, regard to their work. Thank you. Back to you. Um, Nicole, hi. Good to see you again. We're former colleagues. Um, I actually wanted to address your question as well and build off of what Lucy and Juma had shared. Um, so I think Lucy's comments about staff burnout are something that we even saw with our field team in Syria and with our community-based organization partners who are local partners on the ground for delivering the psychosocial support program. Um, so we were not able to find any staff care resources on the ground in the Northeast, particularly in Raqqa and Deir ez um, That might be available in Hasake next door, but that's not where we currently operate. Um, so we had reached back out to um, an organization that works globally with a lot of development partners um, and asked them to co-design some staff care sessions with our partners. Um, but that was done remotely. Um, and I think that you know, our partners and our field staff had requested for us to find something in person um, that people could just more easily access. Um, I think the other challenge for us in the Northeast, beyond just having referral, uh, like adequate referral networks that I think Laurel had referenced are available in um, the Nineveh Plains area in Iraq, or, or hopefully will be when they implement this pilot project. Um, so that, that's kind of one challenge we'd love to see specialists come in and train uh, lay people to be able to provide kind of immediate um, support to build up referral systems and to build up that skill set. Um, I think the other issue that we face is that we see a lot of um, development partners and NGOs active in the formal IDP camps. But in fact, in the Northeast, I think the greater population, at least in the Raqqa and Deir ez uh, amongst camps and IDPs are living in the informal camps where there are literally no other service providers there. Um, and so that is really a blind spot in terms of supporting this population. Thanks everyone for that awesome response. Um, we have a couple questions in the chat, so I wanna to turn to those to make sure we can um, cover their questions. The first is, um, from Paul Turner from MSI, hey. Um, he's curious if trauma healing or trauma sensitive approaches 
are more effective with certain types of trauma than others? Good question. It, it's never a one size fits all. I, I, I think that's clear. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I think it's, um, but I, I mean, I, so I think to some degree, some of our tools, I speak for all of us, but I really should be speaking just for myself. Some of our tools can be adapted to different populations, but sometimes for specific populations, you would want to have specific tools. I spent the morning, um, part of the morning, not in this conference, but with a, um, this was early in the morning before the conference started. I didn't miss any sessions, but we had a wonderful internal presentation about um, tools for women who've experienced gender-based violence. And they were, you know, they were very specific for women who have experienced gender-based violence. I'm not sure that I would take one of our peace building tools and just kind of slap it on that group. Um, so I'm really glad that we have specialized tools as well. And I can imagine that that's true for many other groups too. And I'm glad that Anita's nodding her head so she can hopefully say something. I, I was looking through as well. And Lucy, I too was in an early morning meeting. Unfortunately, I did miss some sessions, but we were looking at tools for our new projects and what we wanted to measure and what was the impact. But because TICE is a foundational framework, we, we discuss and impact the same concepts, but have different curriculum and different uh, yeah. forms of measurement. And it's it's specialized and contextualized, but not so much so that it, um, it's also generalized if that makes yeah. sense, because hopefully we're part of a bigger intervention and bigger network of support. It really does take all of our organizations to move the needle. Thank you both. Um, the next question is from Julia. Forgive me if I mispronounce your name. She says she's studying the ineff uh, inefficiencies of the Italian reception system dealing with an unaccompanied refugees with mental discomfort or victims of torture. The question is about the impact of COVID with all the movement restrictions that come with it on accompanied minor refugees with mental discomfort or victims of torture that are forced to stay in closed structures. Do you think this may worsen their psychological trauma? We're getting a good head shake from, a good sad head shake from Lucy. Yeah, I'm. somebody else talk. <laughs> I'm right, but sure. Yeah. And more, can you say more to that? Or why you think that would? It's what you started out with, Meg. I mean, it's the layers upon layers. So it's not only that the restriction may trigger other traumas, but you don't have access to the support. You don't have access to hugs. You don't have access to touch. You don't have access to um, the the natural interpersonal relationships that that as human spiritual beings are just part of how we naturally work. Um, it's so much harder. Um, yeah. We do the best we can. That's all we can do. And I, I mean, I think there are increasingly creative ways, but it's through this, this computer screen all the time. Um, and it's, you know, it's just not comparable, really. But it's the best we can do. Can I do a quick follow-up question? I see you, you've come on live, Lydia, which we're glad to have you. I just re really quickly, you know, you talked about the importance of touch and just physicality in healing and being whole as a human, as communal creatures. Like, do you feel that there are some mental health issues that cannot or won't be addressed until you know these restrictions are over and we can have go back to physical touch and normal interactions not to diminish any of the things you're doing in the field <laughs> but um i'm just interested from the experts perspective Oh, 
I'm, especially for children, especially for children. Yeah, it just, it breaks, it breaks my heart. Uh, and Meg, if I may just add uh, to that uh, briefly, um, by just giving an example, I was speaking to my cousin, uh, I've been in touch with him uh, for a few days and uh, there are a few things that are bothering him. Unfortunately, he's in uh, Nairobi, which is like 500 kilometers away from where I am. And I'm the only person that uh, he could uh, comfortably speak with. So I was uh, speaking to my aunt today just to allow him to come over and stay with me. But uh, my aunt can't allow that because of COVID. And that is just one example to show how, how much uh, this COVID is uh, inhibiting uh, access to support uh, in cases like those ones. Because the only way my cousin could be able, and he, he would be comfortable talking to me because he feels like I'm the only person who can be able to understand him. So in relation to that question, I think, yes, there is some limitations in uh, these restrictions that we have in currently. I would just add really quickly that one of the things, and I'm sort of shifting spaces a little bit, but looking at sort of the gender space, we are definitely seeing new barriers, right? The question of do women have the same access to, do young people have the same access to technology to enable this kind of participation? Do they have access to Wi-Fi? You know, so we're looking at COVID and these restrictions in terms of the barriers, but we're also seeing openings of challenges. And some of the questions of um, the support to remote areas in, in certain contexts has actually broadened participation in some programs and in some activities. And we're seeing that some people who couldn't travel in person to the workshop can now get online and they can be part of it. So I think that it's kind of a multifaceted question in the sense of, yes, I mean, also speaking as an anthropologist, people need people, right? Like that's, we're social beings, but we're also extremely adaptable. And I think we also are looking at a context that has a really rapidly shifting set of barriers and opportunities right now now that um, offer a lot of space for thinking about how to best um, carry forward. So as we get to a post-COVID space, think about like, well, how do we hold on to the things that we didn't expect to work, but did? <laughs> like, how do we hold on to those and continue to implement them while then going back to sort of these, you know, to the extent that we can, these in-person interactions that we know are really effective in certain kinds of contexts? Thank you. All right, we have Lydia up and live and she has a question for you. So go for it, Lydia. Hi, um, I'm in the UK and it's evening. So I thought I'd share my Christmas tree with you. Um, <laughs> thank you to the panel. Um, it's been fantastic. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna take advantage a little bit. My question isn't related to COVID, but since a lot of you are working on trauma in conflict affected places like my question it relates to that um so i work for the um the uk's foreign commonwealth development office um in the research and evidence division um anita i was particularly interested in your talk um about south sudan and you mentioned 36 percent um of, of 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 your cohort had um symptoms of ptsd um, I was in I was in South Sudan between um, 2007 and 2014. Um, 36% actually seems like a low number to me. Um, it seems like a, a deeply traumatized population. And my feeling has always been that if we as the international community had focused more on the trauma of the population, then the country may not have slid back to war as it did in 2013. Um, that, that's quite a big leap of logic, but um, but but it's a it, it's it's the feeling I have. Um, so my question is for for the panel: um, in as we are getting more restricted times in terms of funding and in terms of international uh, development money being available, how do I? as an advisor in the, in, in, to a donor, make the argument that we need to focus on trauma and mental health from a, from a very cynical perspective of it will help prevent a return to conflict. D is the evidence there? I'm, I'm looking to the panel, share, share, share your thoughts with me.
I'll just jump in briefly because we don't have much time, but yes, I'm with you. And and you're right about the low percentage in the South Sudan. And, and part of that is about the tools and the measurements, which once again was part of this conversation because that was the baseline. So what do people understand? And it talks about power and privilege. We use validated measures so that the research um, is robust, but does that match people's experiences? Sometimes when we ask questions, and say within the last seven days, have you had experiences of, you, or think of the think of the incident, you know, and do you, and they're like, what incident? It's because they've lived a life, unfortunately, of a lot of hardship and trauma. So they don't have one incident, um, which is why we triangulate our measures with self-report and qualitative and heart rate variability. So we can show that there is improvement and impacts. And um, people in South Sudan told us the same thing. If I had had this um, trauma healing, you know, in, in the beginning, things would have been different. Um, even we work with local providers who come in their professional roles and around day four of our training, they always say, oh, I came to learn about trauma, but I didn't realize I had trauma. And we never label people, you know, uh, uh, diagnostically, but we open the discussion, which therefore allows um, for reflection. And we think that's the heart of the work and to recognize that mental health and um, trauma impact, education, parenting, livelihoods, um, it, it's far reaching. So if we can um, focus on that, there are better effects in many different areas. If individuals are so stymied by the fear, by their the stress, the anxiety, the past trauma they've experienced, they can't move. They can't participate at a community level. And if they can't participate at a community level, then communities can participate with other communities. So you'll have these leaders up, you know, go to some fancy hotel in Addis Ababa, you'll excuse me, maybe not today, but, but generally, and, and make it some agreement, but it doesn't filtrate through because people are just stuck, frozen, from fear, from anxiety, and from past trauma. You have, our whole peace building philosophy is built on the individual, the community, and then the inter-community to the national level. And you have to work at all three layers to build a social cohesion and the peace that's needed. And yes, there's increased research on that. It's not as cut and dried and quick as we would like it, but it's getting there. You'll find it. And this is just sort of a marginal point. It's not as a fulsome response as those that have been given so far. But one of the things that we really do want to see through these pilots is these the communities that we are specifically targeting. We want to see them rebuilding their lives, but also rebuilding their communities. And that's a big part. And rebuilding their communities, what we mean by that is also social cohesion. So thinking about the fact that these are often diverse areas in northern Iraq where ISIS really exploited a lot of the diversity and turned it into... Um, um, points of conflict and points of trauma and a number of other, you know, very negative outcomes. How do we really think about um, being a part of a solution to help do um, to address some of these MHPSS issues as part of leading to positive rebuilding? Uh, both of individual households and of communities. So that's very much a part of the sort of integrated layered thinking about how do we build this stability help? We're not gonna do it. How do we help the people there build this stability for themselves going forward? I, I, I'm Thank just you, a little link to the, um, I know we're at time. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave a minute for last remarks as, in case we don't get booted off, but I'm just sent a link to an, a publication by my friend and former colleague, Belkis Lopez about South Sudan and, oh, wrong chat, um, about uh, PTSD and support of reconciliation and the linkages there. So that might be an interesting place to start. You've probably already read it actually since you've worked so much in, in South Sudan. Um, we are over time, but I wanted to just open it up for any final remarks from our panelists. Um, any last comments? Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for speaking and sharing about this amazing work you're doing. Thank you so much for everyone participating and sitting in on this pretty long panel. Thanks for your attention and um, 
interest. We're really grateful for you. Um, yeah, so take good care. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much.